Thank you very much. We, we live in a time of unprecedented um, flux and change globally and nationally. It's, we're living in a world where there's mass confusion, mass uncertainty, and it seems that anything is possible. If you look at the last year alone, in terms of global events, there was the BP oil disaster, nuclear disaster in Japan, there was the WikiLeaks revelations that exposed some uncomfortable truths in relation to Shannon, Iraq, Guantanamo and beyond. There's youth-led uprisings in Egypt, Tunisia that have moved into Spain, and there's glimmers of it happening in other parts of the world, including Ireland. There was the right-wing terrorism in liberal left Norway. There's the collapse of global institutions and banks, but yet bonuses still being paid. It looks like the world's biggest economy and perhaps most powerful nation that ever was is on the verge of an economic default on its own debts, perhaps within days. And it looks like China is definitely about to emerge as the true new superpower. We're in an age of peak oil, climate disasters, the extinctions of languages, cultures and species. 25,000 still die every day through poverty, although we still are in a world of plenty. We see return to famine in Somalia, potential loss of fish stocks, of clean water. Military spending globally has increased 50% in the last 10 years to $1.7 trillion. The leader of the IMF has been accused of rape. The leader of the world's biggest media conglomerate is on the rocks as well. The tectonic plates are absolutely shifting. It is an unprecedented time, time of questioning, confusion, but also awakening. Old systems are crashing, and it's yet to be seen what new systems will emerge in their place. Ireland is very much in the eye of this storm, but also in the eye of our own very particular Irish storm. If you look at ourselves compared to many of the countries in the Middle East or Africa or beyond, we still have it relatively good, and it is important to remember that. However, we do have a mass range of failed institutions, whether they be church, politics, government, industry, unions. Many of the public are left dazed and confused. We're questioning our values and also our viability as an independent state. There seems to be a lack of vision, a lack of foresight, and a lack of hope. 440,000 people are denied the dignity of the basic right to work, to have an income, to make a contribution. We have a dependence on multinationals, whereas we've lost any sense of Irish-led manufacturing or Irish-led economic growth. We have fertile land. We have an abundance of natural resources in terms of potential for wind, potential for wave power, but yet we import 90%, over 90% of our energy and we import over 90% of our food despite a fertile agricultural land that is largely unused. Meanwhile, we have over f an in independent Indicon report in recent years suggests that we have 430 billion euros worth of oil and gas reserves um, off our coasts. Despite a proclaimed Christian or social justice value base, we, we still remain one of the most unequal countries in the world, where the rich have gotten richer over the last number of years and the poor have gotten poorer. Plenty of talk in the last election about radical reform, great promises, great shifts, but very little in reality in the last several months. Bank bailouts continue, cuts to already struggling health, education services continue, and no justice, no jailing for the bankers, for the corrupt politicians, for the bishops, for those that have abused their power. We see a targeting of younger people, people that are supposedly defrauding the dole um, as a priority in terms of seeking justice or redress. It seems that Ireland is now one of the most indebted countries in the world. It seems that we have inherited a legacy of gambling and good times that were had at our expense. 
When we look at um, young people growing up in Ireland today, it definitely seems that it is a world in, it's a spun out world to, to take the name for our website, spunout.ie. Um, over 40% of our population is under 30. We have, in fact, the youngest population in the EU and we have the highest birth rate in the EU, which makes this debate and this discussion all the more important and all the more relevant Young people aren't a homogenous group. They represent different backgrounds, different abilities, different thoughts. They don't necessarily agree with me or me with them. They're, of, of 16 to 25 year olds throughout Ireland, there's over 630,000 of them. And I can't profess to represent them today. And certainly at the age of 33 and plenty of gray hair emerging on both sides, I certainly don't have that right to speak on behalf of all young people. And certainly there are some younger people today and perhaps those that are still very much young at heart and young in vision. And I think the, the discussion and the debate after, after we talk is, is, just, is going to be just as important as what we say here today. Over the last few days, I've tried to gauge my response to the, the question posed, is Ireland a good country for younger people? And what I, what I did is I went to our website and I went to our Facebook community and we, we had a poll to ask, to, ask, excuse me, to ask young people what they thought in response to that question. And what we found from 430 um, responses was that 29% of pe young people felt that Ireland is a good country for younger people. Thanks. 29% felt that Ireland is a good country for younger people. 28% felt it is okay, and 43% felt it is not good. The 43% seems to connect with a recent Irish League of Credit Unions, I think it was Irish League of Credit Unions poll that suggested that 45% of Irish people don't see any future in this country. So whilst a significant amount still feel that Ireland is a good country, it still offers them a lot, uh, an increasing amount don't. 43% is a lot and it is a worry. And in my last 10 years, I've been involved in youth development and setting up a youth organization and in many ways growing, growing up with that process myself. And I have to conclude that whilst Ireland has achieved a lot for young people and still is achieving a lot for young people, we are failing in the long game of supporting the moral, emotional, sexual, spiritual, physical, economic and happiness, growth and well-being of young people. If we look at some of the statistics around that, 32% of 16 to 25 year olds are unemployed. 45% of young men 16 to 25 are unemployed. 65,000 emigrated last year. Suicide rates are up 13% to fourth highest in Europe. We have the highest rate of homicide amongst young men in Western Europe. We have the highest use of synthetic drugs amongst young people in Europe. We have one of the highest rates of binge drinking in Western Europe, with 50% of 15 to 16 year olds having claimed to be drunk in the last month. We have the fourth lowest spend on education in the OECD, and cuts continue. 25% of young people are deemed to be functionally illiterate by the OECD. We have the second highest class sizes in Europe. One in four are overweight or overbeast. A recent UNICEF report said that 50% of young people have said that they have, have or have had, that they have or have had suffered depression, and 25% said they have been suicidal. Meanwhile, there's a two or three year waiting list for HSE psychiatric treatment for young people. Youth and community groups like our own have been cut 20% on large in their funding. Our own organization is majority funded by philanthropic funding from the likes of Atlantic Philanthropies and One Foundation, and the state funding remains very small percentage and diminishing. 199 young people have died in the care of the HSE in the last 10 years. A report in Irish Times the other day said that foster carers in Dublin haven't still been vetted for child protection in certain areas. We see that sad news to emerge from Donegal in the last few days that uh, a, a convicted rapist was hired by a secondary school. 
despite pleading guilty to the rape in a court case and having a suspended sentence. He's now in prison, but he was left in the school without proper vetting and so on. But the school was aware and the community were aware and the guards were aware. Questions whether Ireland is a safe country for young people. Quite a serious situation. So young people growing up today, it's a complex world, it's a pressurised world. You could argue that it always has been. It's never been easy. It could be a, a great time to be alive in many ways, but it is a complex pressurised world. There's a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of media saturation about doom and gloom about the future. And this is what younger people coming into the world are faced with. They're being sexualized at an earlier and earlier age to the point where there isn't any great research at the moment to prove this that I'm aware of, but I, I, I propose that the majority of young people uh, get their sexual health education from pornography on the internet. And that's where they, they are introduced to the world of sex and relationships, which would be an otherwise healthy and loving thing. Um, the definition of success still centers around money, progress, housing, careers, a long way away from the definition of health and well-being. And then there are more marginalized young people growing up in areas of deprivation. Are rural areas like Donegal have suffered harder than most in many ways. There's gay and lesbian young people face a lot of bullying and stigmatization. Young carers, young people in, asylums, in the as asylum-seeking system. There's a lot of vulnerable young people out there that still aren't getting the support. I do acknowledge that there are great supports and more than ever. There's organizations like our own. There's a growing range of websites and platforms for young people to get involved with. But if you take the example of the Irish Youth Parliament, Dolnanog, it meets one day per year. It seems to be a photo opportunity for the relevant minister of the day and it has no teeth or no muscle to take action. It's simply a talking shop. We don't take young people's rights and power seriously. Young teachers, young solicitors, young activists, Young politicians, young civil servants are all struggling to get heard, to get seen, to get through, to break through the doors. I think what's happening today even to have this discussion is, is to start hopefully of a new year for McGill. Perhaps next year we'll have a youth day or a youth afternoon or a youth evening where we, we really do have 15, 16, 20 year olds being heard and being seen. Local young people and young people from around Ireland because they're well fit to speak and they know what they want. Politics for young people, many are engaged, but many have become mini-me's of the masters of the party. They tend to take the party line quite often while still injecting an element of youth energy. 50% or less of young people don't vote compared to 80% or more in Sweden. Many young people are switched off because they haven't been raised for civic engagement. They've been raised for the marketplace or raised for careers. They see politicians or politics as a choice of Tweedledum or Tweedledee. They see that the, the world of banking and the, mar the so-called markets, whoever the markets are, I haven't met them myself, but the markets seem to make more decisions. So it seems that increasingly politicians are irrelevant. Many young people would have turned to parties like the Green Party to see them as a, a different choice or a radical choice. They, they were interested in issues like the Hill of Tara or the Car of Gas thing or Shannon more radical or, or front-end issues that might, some of the bigger parties might not address, but the Greens, in many ways, left their policies behind for power and suffered in the ballot box. It seems that young people, a lot of young people see that the priority is giving to bankers over young people, that there's a lack of inspired leadership, a lack of ethical leadership, that the systems involved in youth politics don't support their interest. If you look at the election date that's just been announced for the presidential election, we all know now categorically that Fridays or weekends are a better day for engaging young people in elections, but it does seem that they've chosen a Thursday for the youth vote once again. It seems that young people, like many of us, are turned off by the corruption, by the talk, by the chat that surrounds characters like Michael Lowry, like Bertie Ahern, like Ivor Callaly, like the Healy Rays, the Ray Burks, and the corruption and the, the money shifting that goes on around. In short, many young people feel underrepresented, not involved, not respected, or not valued. They feel a sense of despair. Many turn to self-medication through alcohol or drugs. Many turn to harmful behaviors 
Many emigrate because they don't feel Ireland is a good place that values them. And increasingly, but not enough, young people turn to getting involved and to social activism and to making a difference. And through my own work, we, we have many good examples of young people actually do have getting stuck in. So it's not black and white and it's not all, it's not all a write-off. There are many involved, but certainly not enough. If you look at our history, particularly around the last century, around industrial schools of the 1940s and 50s, and if you look at the church reports now of the wholesale abuse of young people, we have to ask ourselves, not is Ireland a good country for young people right now, but has it been a good country for young people and children? And it, it seems to be that it hasn't been a safe country to be a child or to be young. The abuse that has taken place in this country is an indictment on us. I don't think we should wallow in that, and I don't think we should despair, and I don't think we should be victims. But I think we need to acknowledge it. I think we need to own up. I think we need to get redress. And I think more than anything, we need to prevent it happening again. And still that isn't happening through, through child prevention measures and so on. It's very clear that Ireland needs youth energy to transform and transcend our current problems. Young people have, without a doubt, the ideas, the talent, the energy, and the skills to transform Ireland. It's not that we have to hand young people the keys to the car or the keys to the government. We can do it in partnership with young people. A combination of old and young is quite a powerful one. Maybe the old, wise brain and the young, vibrant, energetic heart is a powerful recipe. I think young people, particularly when we're out of sync with the rest of Europe, are our biggest natural resource, and we are untapping that. Young people are consigned to the dole, to emigration, and many to suffering in silence through mental ill health. If we don't engage young people, we're going to pay the price. It's very simple. It'll be an economic price, and it'll be a social price. We'll, if, we'll feel it ourselves, we'll feel it in our families, and we'll feel it in our pockets. We also risk a great deal of social turbulence and tension because sooner or later, several hundred thousand young people aren't going to take it anymore and they're going to come kicking the door. What we need as a society is radical change, not the type of radical change that party policy manifestos talk of. We need deep and meaningful radical change. We have radical problems. It is a momentous time. We have the opportunity to transform and to replace old ways, old systems, old thinking. We need to own up, take control, take responsibility, to confront the abusers that have abused power in this country, to allow alternative thinking, alternative views to get heard and get seen in the media and in the political debate. We need dissent as a important element to democracy rather than consigning the idea of dissent to loony, lefty or whatever the label might be. Dissent can be seen as a, hesity, as a healthy, positive thing. We need to question more and stop waiting for others, stop believing the spin, stop believing the polished speeches. The politicians don't have the answers to this. They're bluffing. The bankers don't have the answers. They're bluffing. We have the answers to this, but we haven't woken up to our own power. We need to get engaged individually and collectively in making this happen. It is up to the Irish people to make it happen. It is up to young people to rise up and stand up. It is up to all of us to join together. We have a failed social and economic model. We need to stop following other countries off the cliff. We need a new country, a new vision, and a new constitution. We need to invest in young people to ring fence health, education, youth, child and family support spending as a priority over banking. We need a participatory democracy where we're involved much more in decision making than once every five years stroking a pen at a ballot box. We need to be involved and that requires effort and responsibility on all of us and that includes true youth participation at all levels whether it be in spunout.ie or McGill or Fianna Fáil or Fianna Gael or wherever that might be. We need an education reform process that radicalises education to generate whole healthy citizens rather than 
products for the marketplace. We need young people to leave school ready for the challenges of the modern world, ready to be healthy, ready to be happy, ready to be loving, caring, compassionate, active citizens. We need to confront our culture around alcohol. It's time to challenge the industry, the advertising, and the joking that we see ourselves engaged with as alcohol. It is a big taboo. Each of us has that role to play. The conditions are very ripe. The time is ready. A few days ago at the UN General Assembly, a resolution was passed that has earmarked happiness as a development indicator. Think about that, happiness as something that we all strive towards rather than development or progress. Let's name it happiness. The National Economic and Social Council has already called for this, which defines happiness as a healthy mix of health, education, values, relationships, and it looks at are we really achieving, are we really succeeding in a goal towards a society of well-being. Some of the bigger countries laughed at this idea at the UN General Assembly. They, it came from the small country of Bhutan that has a gross domestic happiness indicator as its measurement for success. Some of the countries, bigger countries laughed, but the Bhutanese representative turned around and he said, look it, if you don't have a dream, you've nothing to work towards. It's very simple. At the moment, Ireland doesn't seem to have a dream. We need to have a dream. Now is the time to wake up and make the dream happen, and it's up to us.